Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And can I welcome everyone to the 21st meeting of the Social Security Committee? Can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones off as they interfere with the sound system? Apologies have been received from Mark Griffin, who will be slightly late due to transport difficulties, I believe. Uh, first item on the agenda is the Social Security Bill, and it's evidence from the Minister for Social Security, Jean Freeman. And can I welcome the Minister? Can I also welcome uh, officials Colin Brown, James Wallace, Chris Boyland and Dandy McClintock. Uh, Minister, I believe you want to make an open statement. Thank you very much, Convener, uh, and thank you to members. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I'd like to place uh, on the record my sincere thanks to everyone who has given evidence to the committee so far, whether that was in person or in writing. Our whole approach to building a new social security system for Scotland has been to make use of the knowledge and the expertise of those with lived experience of the DWP's existing system. This includes, of course, the Social Security Bill that we're here to discuss today, and its genesis lies in the consultation that took place over the summer of 2016. We had 521 detailed responses to that consultation, which we published in February, along with our findings and independent analysis. And since that consultation, I have attended over 70 individual meetings with more than 50 separate individuals, groups or organisations, ranging from Age Scotland to COSLA, from the MS Society to Shelter. And of course, alongside this have been many other contributions that key stakeholders have kindly contributed to our thinking. So the first point I want to make today is that the bill is the way it is because of our wide-ranging, detailed and ongoing engagement work, the scope of which now goes well beyond our consultation to encompass our expert advisory group, the experience panels and the stakeholder groups covering both policy and delivery. Because of this engagement work, we saw before the bill was introduced that there would be a need to ensure an appropriate balance between primary and secondary legislation. That is why we built a mechanism to address this into the bill. Members will have read paragraph 12 of the Delegated Powers Memorandum, which we published back in June alongside the bill, where it says, the Scottish Government is live to concerns about the effect of this approach on the opportunity for the Parliament to control the detail around the different types of assistance during the Bill's passage. The schedules attached to sections 11 to 17 are a way of ensuring that members will be able to control what may be done using the power to make provision about a particular type of assistance. In this way, members will be able to exert just as much control as they would if the rules were set directly on the face of the Bill. So we have addressed by design the need to ensure the right balance between primary and secondary legislation. We have also already taken steps to address another key concern, which is to ensure that our secondary legislation receives the input and scrutiny that it needs. We committed to producing illustrative versions of some of the regulations which we will make under the bill, and I was pleased that last month we were able to share with this committee the first illustrative drafts of our planned Best Start grant regulations. These have also been shared with stakeholders, and I took part in a discussion with them about our with our Best Start grant reference group last Thursday. We've sought feedback on our illustrative regulations to ensure that we get things right. I feel the same about this bill. For example, in sections 11 to 17 of the bill just now, where it specifies that assistance may or may not be given in the form of money, it does not say that the individual should always have a choice of whether or not to receive this assistance in any form other than cash. Our policy memorandum, I believe, makes clear that we would wish the individual to have that choice. Our intention is that individuals should always have that choice. And so I will make changes at stage two of the bill to make that clear. Similarly, we've had a great deal uh, during stage one evidence about independent advocacy and how advocacy, as Inclusion Scotland have put it, is vital to ensure that the rights of those who cannot properly communicate their needs are upheld 
and that, and I quote, it helps people to access advice and services that they would otherwise be unable to engage with due to communication needs. I'm grateful to Inclusion Scotland and others for their evidence in this matter, in particular, the clarification that advocacy does not mean mediation, giving advice, or speaking up for someone when they are able to express themselves. And I'm happy to say that we will take steps to address this, is this issue at stage two. We've also responded to concerns about independent expert scrutiny, which I think we all accept is about more than just the scrutiny of legislation, important though that is. Members are aware that the Short Life Working Group, made up from our expert advisory group on disability and carers benefits, has begun its work, which I tasked them to do, and I am grateful for their time uh, on Tuesday to update me on their thinking so far and for the discussion that we had then. They are working at pace. I know have had a discussion with this committee and will be holding a workshop with a wider group of stakeholders later this month. Convener, I hope you and colleagues found the session with the working group uh, useful and helpful. You will appreciate that there are a number of interested parties, myself included, who are keen to hear more about this committee's views on the issue, and I hope we'll be able to discuss this further this morning. This is an issue, I believe, where government, parliament and stakeholders need to work together in order to get it right. As I said at the start, stakeholder evidence and our continued engagement with the wide community of stakeholders who have an interest in this legislation is the foundation for this bill. It has guided us in its development and drafting, leading us to make our legislation, I believe, clear, accessible and flexible by putting the cardinal points into primary legislation and the detailed rules for the operation of our Scottish benefits into subordinate legislation. We have continued, as you know, with that direct involvement since the bill was introduced uh, with our 2,400 volunteers in our experience panels. And we will go on uh, into the future. The experience panels have been established to run for at least four years, by which time the new Scottish social security system will be in place, our new agency will be up and running, and we will be delivering benefits to the people of Scotland. Convener, thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any questions the committee may have. Uh, thank you very, very much, Minister. Uh, I'll start off with a kind of overarching uh, question. Uh, and I note in your opening remarks, you mentioned about primary legislation and subordinate and secondary legislation also. Uh, obviously, we've heard from various stakeholders in regard to what would be on the face of the bill, primary, secondary legislation, and also su super affirmative procedures. Uh, I know that you've mentioned this in your opening statement, but perhaps can the Minister perhaps expand uh, on uh, what the Scottish Government's proposals are in these particular areas, apart from what you've already said in your opening statement, in particular in regard to on the face of the bill legislation, which a number of stakeholders have asked us to expand upon, and obviously the legislation that's going forward. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Convener. If, if I can just... So, let me start with the consultation and everything that we have heard from people since in terms of how the current system works, one aspect of how the current system works. And it has been very clear to us uh, throughout that time that uh, individuals and stakeholder organisations find the current UK system uh, confusing and difficult to identify partly what the uh, situation may be in any particular instance. And that is partly because uh, there is in primary and secondary a mix of uh, cardinal points and regulation and rules. Uh, and we set out uh, to try and make our proposition clearer for people. So that in primary legislation, we would make the cardinal points about a social security system for Scotland, but in the regulations for each type of assistance, we would, if you like, tell the whole story about that type of assistance, um, congruent with those cardinal points, but in the regulations making uh, clear eligibility and the type of assistance and so on and so forth. We believe that that then allows 
individuals, certainly, but also those who are working with them and for them to be very clear uh, and to fairly straightforwardly identify for any one person uh, their eligibility and the requirements that would be placed upon them to demonstrate that and the rules surrounding any particular type of assistance and what they can expect. The critical uh, part of all of that, of course, is how then, and you know, I'm conscious that there is no perfect way of doing this. Uh, I think, as one of your colleagues has said to me, uh, it's a difficult thing to get right, and so good luck with that. I'm, I'm conscious that it isn't, there is no perfect way of doing it. But what we hope we'll be able to do, with the committee's uh, support, is uh, introduce and ensure that in terms of the regulations, not only uh, do we adopt in uh, the majority of instances an affirmative approach, but that we uh, add elements to that which might uh, be called super affirmative, although I'm conscious that there's more than one model of super affirmative, uh, which allow uh, members of this parliament to uh, be engaged and to scrutinise draft regulations before they are laid. Uh, it also uh, should uh, uh, ensure that uh, stakeholder groups are consulted in draft regulations before they are laid. And so, as an example, the illustrative regulations that we have produced on Best Start Grant and the ones that we will produce on funeral assistance are not simply there to provide an illustration of what we expect to, members should expect to see in, the re in regulations, but also the approach that we would take um, in consulting on the drafts of those uh, prior to formally laying them before the parliament. Um, if I can also just touch on the question of independent scrutiny, I'm sure we will get into that in more detail. Uh, but it is my firm view, whatever uh, uh, resolution we, I hope, collectively come to on that matter, that in addition uh, to uh, Parliament committees having an important scrutiny role, that we will have uh, an independent body uh, charged, at least in part, in terms of its remit with scrutiny. Uh, and I believe that uh, ministers should be required to consult that body uh, in advance of making regulations uh, or changing matters with respect to social security. That is very different from the current position at UK level with the Social Security Advisory Committee, where there is no obligation or duty on ministers to uh, engage in that consultation prior to making their decisions. Uh, so I'm hoping that if we take all of that in the round, my proposition is that uh, we have got the balance between primary and secondary uh, uh, clear and that we are uh, building in and open to propositions to build in uh, aspects of the affirmative process that would take it to the definition or our definition collectively of super affirmative that gives members the assurance that they'll be able to look in some detail at those regulations as they come forward. Thank you very much, Minister. I think that's clarified quite a bit, but I know there's a number of members wishing to come in. I may come back in later. I think Ruth Maguire wanted to come in first, was it? Yep. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister. I'd like to ask about um, redeterminations and um, appeals. I think that um, there's quite a bit of um, good faith and hope out there amongst folk who will be using the system, which has probably been helped by the consultation and the approach that's been taken. But that said, people's, um, I, I think, still can't help their, but be, you know, coloured by their the, the experience that they've already had. And, and it's come across quite a bit in um, evidence. And I think probably... Um, for me personally, particularly in an event, um, an Inclusion Scotland event that myself and Polly McNeill attended, that, that people do have um, concerns about redetermination. I wonder if you could set out um, how that will be different, how that process will be different to the current um, system and why it needs to be a mandatory reconsideration, redetermination, not reconsideration. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to, um, and thank you for the question. 
Um, so, as I understand, the, the current proposition, as people experience it in uh, the current system, is that if they um, challenge the decision that is made, uh, they, uh, that, that decision um, is then uh, uh, reconsidered. Uh, and there is no particular timescale around that, and the individual's position is that should the initial decision be one that reduces their benefit, then that decision is enacted straight away. So our proposition, I think, is significantly different. What we are proposing is that where an individual challenges a decision uh, that the uh, agency has made, first of all, when the agency advises them of their decision, they will be advised at the same time of their rights uh, to disagree and uh, of the process clearly set out uh, about what would happen uh, if they do and of the timescale that the agency has to uh, consider their challenge within. Uh, that uh, challenge is then uh, looked at uh, in terms of the whole application being looked at afresh, which is why we are calling it a redetermination. So if, if, for instance, I was a person who made the decision in the first instance and you challenged it, then uh, what would not happen is that James here, my colleague, would not take my work and check what I'd done. He would look at your application afresh and reach his own view. Let's presume that he agreed with your challenge. That is the decision. If he agreed with me, then you're advised of that and you're advised then of your right to go to appeal. And it would then proceed uh, to appeal in normal course. Um, so, and the, the final uh, significant difference, I think, is that in our system, should the decision that I made in the first instance, which you are disagreeing with, have reduced, been a reduction in the amount of financial support that you, would, uh, that you had been receiving, that reduction would not be enacted until the whole process had been concluded. So you would retain your original level of financial support until either we concluded the uh, process uh, with James's decision or it was concluded at appeal. Okay, and, and it has been argued that the mandatory element of that should be taken away from it just your reflections on why that mandatory that needs to be there. Yeah, and, and I, I absolutely understand uh, what is in people's heads when they, when they argue that, because there is a widely held perception that the current system uh, is uh, designed to put people off challenging. Uh, ours is not... And I am finding it difficult to square a rights-based approach with one that would take the rights away from an individual to decide whether or not they wanted to challenge. Uh, so that, that is why I think it should always sit with the individual to choose what they do. If they disagree with the decision, to choose whether or not they want to then challenge that decision mm -hmm. and not for the agency or government to make that decision on their behalf. I also think it is important to put into place a process, that's why we have a timescale, whereby if the agency has got it wrong, it can correct that quickly. Uh, and that is obviously in the interest of the individual too. So in terms of going straight to appeal rather than have the agency um, have the opportunity to correct it, your position would be that there's an opportunity to fix it quicker if, yes. if it goes to the agency. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I had, yeah, sure, on you go. It's, it's just around language. Um, it, it was put to me by... Um, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but I have two subs on the oh, right, appeal. Okay, sure. Is that all right with you? Yeah, Pauline um, and, and Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good morning, good morning, Minister. Yes, it, it's something that Ruth McGuire and I picked up, that the message is not clearly getting through and people are nervous about this aspect of it. Um, so what you describe is quite clearly different from people's experiences. Um, could you just say for the record then, um, 
where is that clearly set out in the way that you have this morning that we can we can point people to? Where, where will that be set out exactly? That that will be set out in the uh, in in the detail that I've described it and what individuals will receive and so on in the uh, agency's operational manual, right. which is part of what our experience panels are currently engaged in in discussing with our officials. So our experience panels are not just looking at the design and so on of individual benefits, they're looking right. at delivery matters and so on as well and working with the agency on that. And in so, terms of um, it being clearly understood, I, I can assure you that I think I have now spoken to every one of the key stakeholders precisely on this matter in exactly the terms I've just done. But I do understand that people um, look at what we are proposing through the lens of their experience of the UK system, yes, and I get that. I think there's an added uh, concern in that is that, so you say it's going to be in the operational manual, but not on the face of the bill, and it won't come through the parliamentary scrutiny process. So we will not be able to see that as you describe it. I mean, that would be my concern. Sorry, excuse me, Lisa. Well, yeah, the other, the other think, place, mm -hmm. my colleague's quite right, of where that would be is in the Charter, where we would expect to see it, is in the Charter. I'm sure we'll get to the question of the Charter at some point, but obviously we'd need to be clear about what the status of the Charter was and the enforceability of, if that was in that okay. question. Okay. okay, thank you. Jamie Balfour, you want to come in a supplementary on that yep. one? Um, uh, good morning, Minister, and can I again just for the record declare that I am in receipt of higher rate PIP and I'm a former... Uh, tribunal member. Uh, one of the issues, just on this very point of reconsideration, Minister, is the double ticking off a form. So you, you make your, you get your decision, you ask for it to be reconsidered, you get the decision back, and if it's negative, you then have to fill out another form and take another form to get the appeal. And a number of organisations have said, could it not just be a one-stage process? Internally, it could be two, but for the claimant, if it is unsuccessful that your colleague James agrees with you unless it goes to appeal, rather than having to tick another form and fill it back in, it just happens automatically. Have you given any thought in regard to that, rather than adding double administration to the claimant? Yeah, I understand that, and thank you very much, Mr Balfour, for raising that point. We are giving some thought to that. Um, we are uh, also giving, having some discussion with our colleagues in the Tribunal and Court Service about what they uh, require and look for in order to minimise uh, the amount of effort the individual needs mm. to go to. So I, I want the decision about what happens next to sit with the individual where they are in a position of challenge, but I do not want to overburden them with lots of form filling, uh, in this instance, or in any instance, actually, um, it, in a way that, that they, feels, they feel precludes them from pursuing it. And I want them to be really clear about what they need to do and what they should now expect and the time frame within they, sh they should expect it. So when we get to the appeal bit, we need to understand what our colleagues in courts and tribunal service require to do their end of that process. And we're discussing that with them. But the objective is to reduce the amount of paperwork and form filling that an individual has to Thank you. follow. Okay. Alison Johnson, you want to come in and supplement you on the same issue? I welcome the fact that, that you're having a very good look at that because uh, you know, I think um, what my colleague Jeremy Balfour uh, you know, suggests there, I think it would help a lot of people if that automatically went forward because the issue is that a lot of people think the internal appeal is the final stage and they don't push it any further. So I think you need to have a balance between making sure that people understand it's not the final stage, but also I think that degree of it going forward automatically would be really helpful and I'd be interested to learn what comes out of that discussion you're having. If I can just say it's, it's going forward automatically provided the individual wants it to go forward. So it's not the agency that automatically forwards it to the appeal stage. The individual has to yeah. say, I've, yeah. I've now got back the, your decision, and your decision is that you don't agree with my challenge. You've looked at it internally. You don't agree with my challenge. I want to go to appeal. They, they need to trigger that. But as Mr Balfour rightly asks, 
they need to trigger that in the in the most simple mm -hmm. simple way possible without lots more form filling. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank, you. thank you. And could I just you know on on the issue of the charter? Uh, previous sessions we had asked about the charter uh, with stakeholders, and a number of them said that the charter, obviously you'd mentioned this, would be on the face of the charter, would be available for people in whatever form, paper form, whatever, that they could see what was available to them in perhaps, you know, basically, you know, advice centres, etc. Is that correct? Will it be available for people to actually see their online or in paper form what exactly is on the charter in concerning appeals? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the charter is where we take the principles of the bill and uh, transfer those into what an individual uh, should expect uh, in their dealings with the agency and what their responsibilities are in their dealings with the agency. Uh, and that is uh, a, a, a document, a piece of paper, mm -hmm that we intend to write with our stakeholders and the input of our experience panels. Um, and I know that I'm sure we will get to it, a discussion around uh, exactly the enforceability and so on of that charter and how you, how you would make those uh, rights and responsibilities real. So it's not just mm -hmm. something on a bit of paper. Uh, I expect the charter to be widely displayed. Uh, and I also uh, have asked uh, our officials who are leading on the implementation of the agency to consider, it depends on the size of the charter to be mm -hmm. fair, um, whether or not that isn't something that people are simply given mm -hmm. um, in their uh, initial and subsequent communications with the agency. Thank, thank you for that clarifies because that's certainly what stakeholders mm -hmm. had asked for. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, you had another question then. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just briefly, it's a question about um, language, Minister. It, it was pointed out to me that the term physical and mental impairment might not um, sit well or might almost be a barrier to folk living with um, conditions that have sort of stigma around them, I think, specifically um, people living with HIV. Um, are those, do those terms, are they, are they fixed? It, it feels a little bit like it's slightly diminishing language anyway, but I wonder if you could just tell me um, why those terms are used. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much. And, and I, again, I understand the, the points that are being raised. The terms are used because in the 2016 Scotland Act, the, in terms of definition of disability benefits, it says... Uh, uh, disability benefit means a benefit normally payable in respect of, uh, uh, and then goes on to, uh, there's, a, there's an part A, part B says a significant need uh, arising from impairment to a person's physical or mental condition. And there is, I think, uh, a need to, where, where, uh, where we can, retain a consistency of language yeah. across different pieces of legislation sure. um, so that, that, that we are clear about what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why we have taken that from the 2016. Okay, Act. thank you. Thanks, Peter. Adam Tomkins. Thank you, Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, uh, cl clearly, um, y you, and this has been clear since you became Minister last, in May last year, you, you want to regard yourself as being accountable to key stakeholders, to um, social security users, um, and, and, and that is, in my view, to be um, welcomed and applauded. But you're also accountable to this parliament. And over the course of the last half hour, as you've been speaking with us, my concern has grown that um, in your desire to be accountable to stakeholders and user groups, the Scottish Parliament is being cut out of various aspects of the process, which make me uneasy, I have to say, as an MSP. So, you know, in your answer to Pauline McNeill's question, you talked about um, the uh, new agency's operating manual. There will be no parliamentary scrutiny of, of that. There is indeed no parliamentary scrutiny of the creation of the agency at all. It's not to be a statutory body. Um, in the um, cr uh, creation of the of the charter that the bill talks about in section three, there's a list of people that must be consulted by ministers in the um, creation of the first charter. That list does not include um, the Scottish Parliament. And this is the core of the concern, I think, um, that the DPLR committee 
had in its recommendations in its report published just yesterday about the balance between primary and secondary legislation, which is the issue that you started talking about with the convener a few minutes ago. And that committee recommended um, that the bill, or concluded that, a, that the bill could better strike the balance um, between accessibility on the one hand and parliamentary scrutiny. And the committee calls for what it calls a reasonable level of detail to be set out on the face of the bill on eligibility criteria and the assistance to be given. That's paragraph 31 of its report yesterday. I have to say, I find those conclusions and recommendations compelling. Um, so what can you say in the light of what I've just put to you to reassure us as MSPs that as well as um, uh, all of the values which we welcome and support of co-production uh, that you have been working so hard to um, uh, engineer over the course of the last year and a half, that the Scottish Parliament also will be front and centre of the design and delivery um, of um, devolved social security in Scotland. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mr Tompkins. Um, uh, I absolutely do consider myself accountable to this Parliament, uh, and actually that is uh, in large part why we as a government have said that the social security delivery uh, body will be an agency precisely because agencies are accountable to ministers and ministers are accountable to this parliament. So the, the operation of the agency uh, will be held accountable through, through the minister being accountable to the parliament. Um, it is not my intention to cut out Parliament and parliamentary scrutiny and involvement from how we construct a social security uh, service and delivery uh, agency for Scotland. Uh, and it may be that there are elements of that balance, which I acknowledged at the outset, is never, uh, there is no perfect balance to strike. Uh, it may be that there are areas where we need to uh, consider again what may be on primary as opposed to secondary legislation. But I would ask members to hold in their heads that it's not simply the uh, important role of this parliament, it is also the delivery experience of those in Scotland who will look to this uh, social security system uh, for the uh, support that they're entitled to. So I am reluctant, for example, to set out eligibility criteria on the face of the bill, on primary legislation, uh, because I believe that that potentially uh, creates difficulties for individuals. So for example, if I set out a list of things that an individual has to uh, produce in order to demonstrate that they are eligible for a particular form of assistance within this bill, if that individual cannot produce every single aspect of that, does that mean that the agency then, not, then cannot have any discretion in order to deliver the benefit? These are matters, I think, that need to be considered in our minds when we look to get what we consider to be the right balance between primary and secondary legislation. I'm mindful of Ms McNeil's point uh, that she made uh, a short while ago about where would our process for redetermination and appeals be set out. Uh, and in that, as in other areas, I am open-minded in terms of where we might make improvements to the bill. I think in my opening statement, I gave a couple of instances where we've already demonstrated, I think, that uh, open mind uh, in terms of what we intend as a government to bring forward as uh, stage two uh, amendments. Um, so I'm not... I'm not sitting here saying, this is what's in primary, that's what's in secondary, and I'm no willing to move. Okay. But I, I am asking members to consider the practical implications of putting some areas into primary legislation that perhaps those giving evidence to this committee have suggested that in practice will actually undercut the approach that we are attempting to take in delivering social security in Scotland, okay. so but, just as I have to consider both. That, that's very helpful, thank you, Minister. Um, you mentioned, um, I think it was in your early opening statement, or it might have been in response to the, to the convener's first question, that um, you recognise the need 
for um, an independent advisory body, um, um, uh, perhaps along the lines of, of, of SAC, but with more uh, powers. Um, and you, and you uh, are attracted by the idea, you said, of um, there being a requirement on ministers to consult this body. Is it your intention um, that the independent advisory body should be a statutory body created uh, in this bill? Uh, and is it your intention that the requirement on ministers to consult it should be a legal requirement again uh, in, 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 in this bill? And if so, will you, are you minded to move amendments along those lines at stage two? Yeah, my, my, my view is that we should have an independent scrutiny body. I'm not settled uh, on whether its role is solely scrutiny or whether it may have a, additional uh, areas to its remit. And I'm looking to um, both this committee, uh, to be frank, and I think I've raised it before here, uh, and also to the uh, expert group uh, to uh, come forward with their views uh, so it, there may be more to such a body than uh, simply uh, scrutiny. Uh, I do believe there should be a duty on ministers to consult with that body before they bring forward uh, draft chain regulations, changes to primary legislation, matters relating to social security. Uh, and I am open to the proposition that it should be on a statutory footing. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, can I ask you about uh, a separate area of the bill, which is the power to create new benefits? It's an important part, as you know, it's an important part of the Smith Commission package, of the Scotland Act package. There are some social security powers that are devolved in full. We have the top-up power, and we also have the power to create new benefits. Um, and there are provisions in this bill that deal with the um, streams of social security that are devolved in full. There are provisions of this bill that deal with the top-up power, Section 45 in particular, but there is no provision of this bill that um, uh, enables uh, Scottish ministers to create new benefits. And you said, well, I've asked you about this in the chamber, and you've said in the chamber that that's because you already have that power and don't need it. Could you just walk me through that? Because I, I'm still struggling to understand why you need, in Section 45, a bespoke power to top up, but you don't need, as it were, a companion bespoke power um, in the bill to create new, new benefits. Well, as you know, Mr. Tomkinson, as I've said, the Scotland Act gives us the power uh, to create new benefits. Uh, I don't believe it is wise. In fact, I think it is quite contradictory um, to worry about um, the degree to which Parliament and this committee has scrutiny over what we're doing, which are many points which I think are fair, but also to want us to put into primary legislation uh, uh, a simple provision that says we have the power to create new benefits without specifying what those new benefits might be, because that then would simply allow us as government to go away and create a new benefit and uh, produce secondary legislation, none of which comes, uh, or the primary, uh, the point of the new benefit does not come to the parliament in, in scrutiny in terms of this committee, but is handled, I, I would imagine, in the, the way I've described in terms of secondary legislation. I don't think that is um, a consistent approach. Uh, so that is why uh, we have not put on primary legislation that kind of blanket proposition about a power to create new benefits. Um, should uh, this government or other governments want to come forward with a new benefit uh, to create, then uh, they would need to come uh, with that as a piece of, of primary uh, amendment to primary legislation to do that. And indeed, uh, I think that we will ourselves be coming at stage two uh, with just such a proposition in order to overcome the difficulty that we've encountered with respect to housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. Members will recall we've currently got an interim solution. Uh, that is fine uh, for now, but it's not a sustainable approach. And the alternative to that is to uh, amend this piece of legislation specifically, which is with a new benefit specifically for that purpose, and we will bring forward that amendment. That is how I think it is appropriate to use the powers of the 2016 Act to introduce new benefits. Uh, and so that is why we have not done that in this bill. 
In terms of top-up, of course, uh, uh, that, that is a, a separate proposition, and the, the primary legislation, uh, as you know, uh, allows us to make the additional payment uh, to carers' allowance, uh, uh, which we intend to uh, introduce as soon as this legislation uh, receives royal assent. Thank you. Paul McNeill, do you want to come in in the back of that one? Because we're Ben McPherson. want to come in. Paul McNeill, then Ben McPherson. Yeah. Um I think obviously this is an important area I think to examine at this point because I, I do agree with you that it is important to get the balance right and everything shouldn't be in the face of the bill and I think there's a good case for that. Uh, but as you know, there are there, there are layers of different witnesses around um, understanding that. So I, I thought maybe a way of maybe just trying to get something on the record about um, the procedure or super affirmative which you've talked about is one way. Uh, in which um, regulations would have a hi higher uh, degree of, of, of scrutiny. So, I mean, let's suppose that, um, so the first set of regulations, let's say on, on Best Start or whatever example you want to choose, and so they would, they would come before the committee and there would be a consultation on it. I I'm trying to think of a scenario where Let's say there was something in the regulations which the committee felt was really against the principles of the primary legislation. But by and large, most of it was okay. But we can't take that bit out, and that's the problem. I just wondered what your view as a minister would be. What would you do in that case? Would you, would you have any power to withdraw the regulations if the committee so felt? you know, that they, they, they didn't um, comply with the principles of the primary legislation. Is there anything that could be done? I think it might be quite helpful to get a chance for that. Okay, so, so let's, let's stick with the, the Best Art grant because that is one that's currently around just now and there are draft uh, illustrative re regulations there just now. Um, uh, and they are in the uh, process um, obviously written uh, by uh, my officials, but in consultation with the key stakeholders through the stakeholder reference group. Uh, now, uh, certainly before the, uh, with this committee, also with delegated powers, and, and I understand yesterday circulated to about uh, 100 different uh, individuals and organizations uh, drawn from our consultation exercise for their comments and views. Um, all of that, including any that this committee might have, will come to me uh, when we get to the stage of uh, uh, l turning those illustrative regulations into draft. Um, it would be, in my opinion, a remarkably foolish government that uh, knew that either stakeholders or, in responding to stakeholders, a committee of this parliament had uh, a serious disagreement with what was in draft regulations and were arguing that they contradicted some of the key cardinal points in primary legislation that nonetheless ploughed ahead with an affirmative process that risks Parliament voting those regulations down. Because that means that you don't have the regulations for that form of assistance and you can't then go ahead and deliver it. So. Uh, we would have two options, I think, uh, this government and any future government. One is to alter between the draft and what is then laid in order to respond to the uh, concerns that have been expressed. And the other is to withdraw. Uh, the third option, of course, is to fire ahead, but risk that you are going to lose that vote in the parliament. Yeah. Uh, of course, the dilemma is always for Parliament if 75% if of it's OK, but 25% of it's not. The problem is you can't amend you know, any part of the super affirmative regulations. Mm -hmm. um, j just um, finally, I uh, just wanted to ask you, um, if an individual claimant or organisation um, felt that the regulations were not compatible with the principles in the bill, then what redress do they then have? Well, um, the, the initial redress is, of course, through the Charter uh, and what the Charter will um, make clear as the, their rights under that Charter. And they would uh, 
raise that uh, I, uh, if initially with the agency, if there was a particular matter that the agency could resolve, uh, or directly with government. And then, of course, uh, all ministers are in, uh, obliged to comply with ECHR and human rights uh, legislation in what we do. Uh, so the final recourse is, of course, that judicial one, which is uh, on the table anyway, in terms of uh, this Parliament's legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Ben McPherson, to come in. Thank you, Con Convener. Good, good morning, Minister. I just uh, wanted to move the uh, questioning on to an area that has produced a lot of evidence, both uh, in writing and orally here at committee, around the, the principles of the bill at, at section one. In your opening remarks, you made reference to the different uh, bits of evidence that have been received around advocacy, and you, you, uh, I certainly welcome w w what you stated earlier around that point. There have been a number of other suggestions, both around uh, amending the principles as currently drafted, and also some suggestions of some, some new principles, uh, particularly in my mind around uh, accessibility, for example. Uh, so I wondered if, just in, as a very broad question, if you wanted to comment on any of the, the suggestions that have been made, um, and then I, I, I have a follow-up about particular principles as, as drafted thereafter. So. Well, one of the, the suggestions that I understand have, have been made, uh, has been made, is around uh, equality uh, and uh, uh, ensuring that there is equality of access and treatment and so on. Uh, and I, I understand that uh, principle um, and why people might want that, and I'm open uh, to uh, that being included. I can see no reason why we wouldn't want to include that. Um, there have been other uh, suggestions uh, about uh, ensuring that um, we tie uh, the principles uh, and the rights-based approach to international uh, conventions. I, I may not be the right word, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, and I would make the point, uh, as I, I've just touched on, that um, the 1998 Scotland Act requires um, Parliament legislation um, to be compatible with ECHR and uh, the Human Rights Act um, also makes it unlawful for public authorities in Scotland to act incompatibly with those convention rights. So everything that we are doing is set in that context. It may be we need to um, remind people of that to make that clearer. Uh, and in addition, um, as Scottish ministers, uh, all Scottish ministers uh, now and in the future, uh, have a requirement to comply with our code, which includes an overarching duty to comply with the law, including international law. Um, so I think that, that what we, we have is our bill, our draft bill, and our principles sit uh, in that landscape very firmly. Um, so uh, maybe there is a case to make that clear, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure that, that we need to do more than make that clear, although people may come forward with propositions to suggest otherwise. I'm also mindful that, um, uh, and, I, and this has risen in a number of discussions I've had with uh, organizations um, who uh, want us to do certain things, uh, and the point I make is that um, Whilst I am intending to create a, a legislative framework for social security in Scotland, in the first instance, that is for 11 benefits. It is for 15%. Um, so I cannot um, have um, this government or a future government um, required to meet obligations that 11 benefits are not sufficient to allow them to meet. So I think we need to get that balance right as well. Indeed, and I think that was, came through in some of the evidence we, we received, that there's that complexity that's difficult to, to navigate. Um, thank you, Minister. Just, just on two of the, the principles as, as uh, currently drafted, um, 
the, the, the Your Say workshop uh, powerfully said that uh, as a group they warmly welcomed the, the principles and particularly support the objective that states that respect and dignity will, will be at the heart of the social, Scottish social security system, as do I. However, there have been some concerns raised with me, particularly by a, a local advocacy agency in my constituency, Advocard, that the, the dignity and respect are subjective terms. And uh, I just wondered if you would be open to perhaps tightening that aspect of the principle in order to make sure that we're, absolute, we're, we're as clear as possible on, on, on what those, those mean in, in, in legislation. And uh, also there was uh, several pieces of evidence given around uh, the, the principle above that, 1B, one, one uh, sorry, the principle below that, 1D rather, uh, around uh, the Scottish ministers having a role in ensuring that individuals are given what they are eligible. And there's been some representations made that this should be a, a duty rather than a role. And I wondered if you could comment on that also. Thank okay. Um, uh, let me start with the last one first. Um, I am open to that, to uh, bringing forward an amendment to make that change. I understand why people uh, want, uh, want that. And the important part for me is in that principle, uh, the, the phrase eligible to be given under the Scottish social security system, because I think that makes it clear what we would be responsible for. Uh, and I think that that is fair enough. Um, the point about dignity and respect is, uh, a fair one. Uh, I read again last night the uh, report from the University of Ulster that ECHR had commissioned, where they talk uh, in some helpful ways about uh, dignity and respect, uh, and that being a difficult, judicially enforceable set of words, concepts. Uh, in that they are, to some extent, largely subjective. And I think where we look to make those more tangible is in our charter. I think that is... I, I don't know how, how you could tighten those in terms of the primary legislation to address the um, issue that you're raising in a way that still retains their meaning uh, in order to make them enforceable. In, in those terms. I think what University of Ulster's uh, report says is, is very helpful in that regard. And they point us towards the Charter. And I think that would be the right direction for us to go in, in, that, re in that respect. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Convener. Okay. Um, George Adams, you wanted to come in on a particular Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. I asked this question previously when uh, we discussed various things. It's about the IT systems and, you know, we can all have great principles and ideals of how we want to treat people and how things are, but the practicality is that come the day of delivery, we could have a situation, governments traditionally aren't great when it's came to IT in the past. We know Audit Scotland have said you were in a good place earlier on when they had a look at uh, everything. You know, where are we now? What is the update now? Because I believe this is important because at the end of the day, the claimants, all they care about is that money's in their bank account. And uh, so, you know, we can talk about everything else. But to me, this is probably one of the most important issues. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Adam. And I think, um, I think you're absolutely right in as much as at the end of the day, uh, what people will care about is that the money has arrived and the, at the right amount uh, to the right bank account and on the right day. Um, I also think that they care about how they're treated mm -hmm. as well, um, but we, we've dealt with that in some uh, other respects. Um, uh, Andy McClintock, as you'll see, is our Chief Digital Officer and is here this morning and will uh, happily provide you with some detail of exactly where we are. Before I ask Andy to do that, can I just remind everyone, including uh, myself, that the approach that we are taking uh, to this is absolutely compliant with Audit Scotland's uh, key lessons learned from uh, previous IT projects, both those that worked uh, and those that have encountered difficulties, uh, which is absolutely not to go for the big bang, but to do it in manageable chunks. And the, the way in which, and that approach uh, sits perfectly with the way in which we are building uh, the agency and taking over 
uh, responsibility for the individual benefits on an incre incremental basis, which also allows us to uh, make best use of our expert group, our stakeholder groups and our experience panels in the design, the test and the build. So that, that overall is the approach across the whole piece around the individual benefits, the build of the agency and the IT, which is the infrastructure to support that. It's the final point I'd make is that uh, our approach is uh, IT is the infrastructure that supports the overall uh, uh, objective of what we're delivering here. And the, the last point, finally, finally, uh, uh, before I hand to uh, Mr McClintock, is to um, just make the point that the, that approach is one that we are adopting and have done uh, from the outset in the Social Security Directorate inside Scottish Government. In other words, in the officials who are working uh, with me and for me on this, in that all our teams are integrated. So we do not have a team of policy officials in one corner working on policy without delivery folks sitting right beside them, advising on whether that is deliverable. Equally, we don't have delivery folks on one side working out an, a good system only to have policy people telling them that it may be a good system, but it's not going to deliver the policy intent, or finance sitting somewhere uh, else altogether. So those integrated teams, I think, exemplify our intent to make sure that all of this works together. But the detail of where we are on the IT build, um, I'm sure Mr McClintock can give you more information. Thank you, Minister. So to give you an update in terms of where we are, the um, Minister has already explained that we are taking an incremental approach to this um, delivery of IT solutions, and it's important to say that this is an IT-enabled uh, programme for delivery. This is not an IT-led uh, approach. Uh, we are picking up very much on the lessons learned by others before us. The Audit Scotland report has shaped our thinking, will continue to shape our thinking. And the recent contract that was awarded some, some week, 10 days ago, is the first step along that, along that journey. It's a, a, a contract for £8.3 million, which was well publicised in the media last week. That will be the first step along a long journey about building an incremental approach to delivery of social security in Scotland. Uh, that approach and that delivery of an award of that contract uh, will take the element of reuse and, and reuse of software that's previously been used across the world. Um, but in, in addition to that, we're looking at reuse of other systems across the UK public sector. So we're not trying to build everything ourselves. We're not trying to do it all in one, in one, in one large release. This is very much an incremental approach. You'll have heard the term agile as a delivery. Uh, that brings a different method, methodology in terms of the way in which projects are structured and the way in which technology is delivered. And as the Minister has outlined this morning, sets out a journey where... We have policy um, colleagues, we have uh, legislation colleagues, we have delivery colleagues embedded in all of those teams to make sure that uh, the users', users needs and respect are at the forefront of everything we do. The engagement of citizens and users along that journey to make sure what we're actually building um, is fit for purpose uh, and, is, and is highly usable as part of that approach. Uh, this will be a three or four year uh, journey of technology delivery that will support multiple benefits. The first wave of those will arrive next year. Uh, and the technology journey has only just begun. Uh, early indications are that we are on the right track. We are learning lessons from those before us. We're taking absolutely all the digital principles, digital standards that uh, we're right to follow into our thinking. And that is why that our incremental approach to uh, procurement uh, and investment is proportionate and is timely so that we can take things in small, bite-sized chunks to make sure that what we're producing, what we're, we're actually delivering, is fit for purpose and will work for both for now and for the benefits of the future. Okay, and I don't know if this is a question for yourself, Minister, or Mr McClintock again, but I remember you mentioned before that the current benefits are spread over various data streams, and in some cases it's a manual system as well. Uh, how are we managing to get... Is that Mr McClintock's... Uh, kind of working with the uh, other UK systems, trying to make a way to embed it in that as well. How, where are we with that? Because that seems quite complicated as well. Okay, so if I can answer that, that question. We are, we are aware that the current UK benefits platforms are predominantly technology driven, <laughs> but there are some off-table solutions and manual approaches. And as part of our journey as we, as we go on, understanding what the way in which we intend to deliver and implement benefits in Scotland, we will be looking to automate as much of that as possible and make sure that the process is end-to-end -end as efficient, end-to-end -end with the citizen in, in, in mind, and, and make sure that as little as possible, 
um, is non-automated. We, we need to learn lessons from systems that have been developed decades before that are, have not been able to keep pace with the modern requirements of citizens and legislation and make sure that as we implement these new, these new technologies that they do so with a citizen at the forefront of what we do um, but very much uh, adaptable to the change in landscape. So it'll be more open and flexible to any changes in the future? As that's well. the plan. So the whole, the whole approach we're taking here is that we're not building something now, locking it down and saying that's what it has to be, and then we have to bend benefits and rules and regulations to fit a system. We're, we're creating an architecture that is loosely designed and coupled that can actually accommodate both changes in legislation, changes in benefit powers, but also changes in technology. Technology will continue to change over the lifetime of the programme and beyond. Okay, thanks. I've got another Sorry. Yes, Minister. Another yeah. point to that, because I, there was a part of your point, I think, Mr. Adam, which was uh, about um, data transfer mm -hmm. and data exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think um, perhaps colleagues have have met before Lisa Baron Broadhurst, who is another of our uh, deputy directors uh, and is leading. Uh, uh, some of the, uh, the program uh, is leading the program delivery work in terms of systems and uh, processes alongside Mr. McClintock and the mm -hmm. uh, uh, IT side. And it, there is, uh, I suspect, daily contact between uh, our officials and DWP officials to work out um, uh, the process for data transfer so that we are assured. Um, that the information we are receiving uh, on those who currently are in receipt of those benefits uh, that we will take responsibility for, that that information is uh, as robust and accurate as we can uh, possibly be assured that it is. Um, so that sits alongside uh, the work that Mr McClintock has described. Okay. I have another question. Do you want, Just yeah. another question not related to this, is that okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely, and then it's Jeremy Balfour. Okay, the, the other thing is uh, Cosler's already brought up an issue that there are people who cannot get access to benefits. They've got no recourse to public funds if they're asylum seekers or uh, or because of their immigration status. Uh, can you tell me, Minister, what your understanding of that situation is currently as well? Um, well, well, that is correct. If, um, if as a consequence of uh, an, in an in individual's asylum or immigration status, they have no recourse to public funds, they have no recourse to public funds. Um, however, uh, this has been raised, and, and there is nothing that we as a Scottish government can do to alter that because it is a consequence of immigration and asylum policy mm -hmm. which sits with the UK government. Uh, and so we are obliged to comply with that. However, uh, there are other areas of support, uh, primarily for children, um, which where um, a proxy for eligibility uh, is used in terms of ex benefits that an individual may be receiving. Thinking about local authorities and uh, uh, access to free school meals uh, or school uniform support or, and so on. Mm -hmm. And in those instances, um, the authorities are perfectly uh, free to find another means of determining eligibility for those individuals other than a receipt of benefits. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've had correspondence with Mr McPherson on that very matter. But in terms of the um, uh, condition of no recourse to public funds that comes as a consequence of a decision or a pending decision on immigration or asylum status, that sits uh, with the UK government uh, is a reserved area and not one that at this point we can alter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ben McPherson. Oh, sorry, no, not Ben McPherson, Jeremy Balfour, sorry. Uh, good morning again, Minister. I have two kind of specific questions and one general question, if that's okay. Um, the first specific question is in regard to the residents of who might get an award. Um, from my reading of the bill, and I'm happy to be correct, but from my reading of the bill, there's no clear definition of residents of who would get this award and how long they've had to live in Scotland and all that. Is that something that will, are you minded to bring forward in the face of the bill or have I missed it? And if so, what kind of residents Clause, are you looking for that? And out of that, 
One of the issues I raise is when people move between different jurisdictions. So if I am on carers allowance, if I get carers allowance um, and live in Aberdeen and due to some change have to move to uh, Newcastle, um, do I take my award with me or do I then have to reapply in, in England? Um, and have there been any discussions between governments in regard to periods of how long people, if they move around, they will live on? But a, a particular round of residence, initial residence, for, for making a claim. Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, we're still having a look at this, but we're, we're minded to follow the existing DWP approach, which is to uh, operate on the basis of uh, what's called habitually resident, I think a fairly widely recognised term uh, in terms of the common travel area and the EU and so on. Uh, so that would be the, the approach uh, I think we are most likely to take. Um, it would, I think, be uh, in regulations for each of the benefits that we would set that out. Uh, in terms of moving between different uh, jurisdictions, uh, we're in discussions with uh, our colleagues in DWP uh, simply to uh, resolve that so that... that uh, uh, this can be as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, it's not new uh, for, for uh, other areas. Um, uh, it's simply about looking at how we operate that in other uh, subject matters, if you like, and whether that is um, agreeable to both, both us and DWP, UK government, uh, in the case of uh, Social Security. And as we resolve that, of course, we will make sure that uh, minister, um, the committee is aware. Mr. Balfour. Uh, and just to clarify, uh, Minister, yeah. once you come to a view in regard to residents, will that be in the bill or will that be in regulation? I think you said regulation, did you? Well, it will be outlined in regulation, but it is actually in Schedule 1, Part 1 of uh, the bill. Okay. Uh, the second area, just to um, seek some clarification on, is in regard to those who have terminal illness. Um, at the moment, under the UK legislation, it's a six month rule. Um, and I've had some correspondence um, f from charities, but also from um, uh, doctors who say, for some conditions, it's very easy to say, sadly, you have six or less months to live on, particularly perhaps those who have cancer. But for some conditions, it's less clear. It, it may be six months, it may be nine months, it may be two years. Um, and also some conditions will have terminal consequences, but maybe not six months, but as I say, 18 months or two years. Would you at all be open to extending that six month figure to maybe a two year? So not an open definition of terminal illness, but extending it from six months to maybe 18 months or two years? Um, well, I, my understanding of this, because uh, of course, this issue has been raised with me, and I have been alert to the views of various organisations, and, the, and there are disagreements uh, between uh, some of our stakeholder groups on this, um, quite strongly held disagreements uh, on it, uh, and uh, I am not minded to take sides on that matter. Uh, I think that... Uh, as I can understand it so far, I'm, of course, open to other representations, but as I understand it so far, uh, the current uh, number of six months also accommodates uh, those who may uh, happily live longer yeah. than that. Uh, and actually, for a number of our clinicians, they are more likely to give a band, if you like, uh, between this and this than an absolute number because they, I think as we all do, understand that in uh, aspects of clinical judgment, as in other areas, there is less binary than perhaps we sometimes might like it to be. So at this point, I am not minded to move beyond what we currently have. I am open to other representations. And the reason I'm not minded to do that is that there is significant disagreement amongst key stakeholder groups and in our clinical community on this matter. Okay, my, my, my final just general point, I mean, picking up a bit um, Paula McNeil and Adam Tomkins point, I, I mean, I, I, I do appreciate that you want to listen to stakeholders and you want to be as open as possible. 
but at some point, we have to make either primary legislation or regulations in regard to who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. And they will become decisions which ultimately you will have to bring forward and we as a, a committee will have to agree or disagree with. Uh, so for take the, the example that a lot of people raised with us is in regard to higher rate mobility. And under DLA, there was a certain um, range that you could walk and that was lowered under PIP. Um, presumably at some point as a government, you will come to a view in regard to that and that they will be in regulations. When will these regulations in regard to PIP be available? Because I think there is concern amongst people. They, they, I think, generally do accept your openness and have appreciated it. But at some point, we have to make some hard decisions. Mm -hmm. And if it's not on the face of the bill, as Polly McNeil says, it comes to us as a committee, and we love 99% of it, but to take a ridiculous situation, you say, if you can only walk a tiny bit, then you don't get it. And we say, well, we like everything, but we have to throw it all out on that one thing. It's very difficult then for us as a committee to make it work. And so is there any possibility <laughs> that these regulations will be at least out there for consultation before we get to stage three of the bill? Uh, no, not, not for uh, every single area of assistance, no. Um, that isn't possible. Um, what, what we will have are the draft regulations on the, what we have described as the first wave of benefits that we will deliver. Um, uh, so carers supplement is, is covered, uh, and so it will be Best Start Grant and funeral assistance. Um, we are at this point um, uh, bottoming out what will be the next set uh, of benefits that we will uh, take delivery of uh, after those first three. Um, mindful of the fact that we have made a clear commitment by the end of this parliament to be delivering all 11 benefits. Um, so there is a, a significant amount of work going on at pace because I am very conscious of two things, as you might expect me to be. One, it's not that long until this parliament uh, reaches the end of its term. Uh, and two, yes, absolutely, uh, hard decisions do have to be made uh, by me, at, for which I am accountable. Um, there will be um, significant uh, uh, consultation uh, around the regulations in terms of the disability assistance benefits, um, both in the drafting of those uh, and in the discussion around the drafting. Um, but th they will be in regulations and, and uh, uh, as members are, I, think, I hope, are clear. I have already accepted the difficulties in striking the right balance between primary and secondary uh, and the um, positives and negatives uh, and where you might set that balance. But I repeat, it would be a remarkably foolish government that brought forward regulations under the affirmative procedure where they knew that there was a significant disagreement on an aspect of them, because that government risks those regulations being voted down, particularly we are a minority government, uh, being voted down and therefore not being able uh, to meet the commitment that it has made to deliver uh, those benefits in the lifetime of this parliament. Um, there are clear uh, consequences to that for a government uh, but more importantly, in my view, there are clear consequences to the individuals that we will not then be assisting until those regulations find approval across the board. So um, I would think we would be exceptionally foolish to get ourselves into that position. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, in responding to Mr McPherson's questions earlier, I was heartened to hear the minister um, say that she was open to bringing forward an amendment at stage two, um, changing the role for the government, maximising the incomes of recipients into a duty, because that's certainly what the cabinet secretary has previously said to the committee. Um, I am quoting here, she said, it's important for the Scottish government to help people to, to navigate their way through the complexity, and that includes ensuring that our new social security agency has a duty to maximise incomes. Um, I'd be grateful if the minister could expand on 
how you see the government meeting such a duty? I mean, could that, for example, be that the new agency, having assessed someone for entitlement to one benefit, might look at what others they are entitled to automatically without that person having to, to fill in various forms? Mm. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I too am mindful of what the Cabinet Secretary uh, said, uh, and uh, there we are. Um, uh, so how might we do that? Um, I think there are a number of ways in, in which uh, we as government w should be expected to do that. Um, the first of those uh, is uh, through the uh, means by which we have said our agency will operate, uh, where we've been very clear that in addition to uh, those employed in uh, the site, the main sites, the headquarters site in Dundee and uh, the large site in Glasgow, uh, that there will be uh, at least 400 uh, uh, staff employed um, spread across all local authority areas in Scotland, including the islands, with a job of pre-claims advice and support. Um, now, the, of course, their primary role uh, or in the first instance, and people will be coming to them in the first instance, around the benefits that we are responsible for. Um, but we have also been clear that their job is to help people secure what they are entitled to, regardless of whether the, that benefit is delivered by the UK or the Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. um, so they would have uh, a key role in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, we've also said that uh, as we, uh, as uh, my officials uh, currently are conducting a series of meetings with local authorities uh, and other uh, key agencies in each local authority area, um, my expectation is that the model of our operation will differ from one local authority to another. Um, for example, in some local authorities, they have reconfigured their own uh, services, their housing and welfare advice and uh, c uh, council tax reduction and so on, uh, services, in order to ensure um, a, a kind of streamlined approach for an individual. So a person may come to them uh, for help and advice on one area, but that triggers support uh, from within that authority in another area. Mm -hmm. In those circumstances where a local authority has done that, I would expect um, local social security agency staff to be working in there and complementing that and therefore be part of that trigger, if you like, trigger approach. Um, the, the overall objective here is that people should receive what they're entitled to with the minimum of fuss and burden on them. Um, congruent with good use of public funds and so on and so forth. But not every local authority is like that. Um, some remain um, uh, disparate in their approach. And so uh, we need to adapt to that and find a way to complement that, but also to act where we can as a trigger to that realignment of services and reconfiguration of services so that the individual can receive um, uh, that more streamlined approach. So that's one way, the delivery. And I think it's a bit of a if I may say so, a bit of a big deal, the way in which we will deliver through these local social security staff. They will not be making decisions. The decisions on an individual's application will sit elsewhere in the agency, and quite rightly uh, so, but they have that role. And if we look to some of the um, uh, work and lessons from Northern Ireland, for example, then we'll see that those uh, comparable approach there has had a significant impact in um, uh, increasing uh, benefit uptake, for example. So the complementary to that, of course, um, is the work we're doing on benefit uptake. And I'm delighted now that um, we are working uh, closely with COSLA and local authorities so that our um, uptake uh, campaign work, which will continue throughout this parliament, is operating at both a national and a local level. On that issue of um, uptake, is the Minister striving for a 100% take-up? Will there be annual targets so that we can assess you know, what the gap is between entitlement and what people receive? Well, we've not, we've not yet looked at that in any detail or, or set uh, a target for ourselves. I think what we and COSLA want to do 
is um, operate, uh, uh, we oper we're operating two um, types of campaign, if you like. One is a general um, sort of tri broad brush trigger campaign. You know, do you, have you thought about what you might be entitled to? Um, that's particularly aimed actually at people who are in work, um, who may consider that um, they are consequently not entitled to uh, support, but they may well be uh, through tax credits and, and other uh, means because of low income uh, from their employment. And then targeting areas where we know there is low uptake. The difficulty we have is that we don't hold the data uh, of uh, uh, uptake uh, across the, all the benefits um, that's held elsewhere or not held at all. So in those circumstances, it is um, a bit more difficult to set a target because you don't have a baseline. Uh, but we do know of some areas where uh, there uh, is low uh, uptake, carers being uh, one of those, and particularly young carers. Um, so we are targeting those. We've just completed the over 65 uh, target uh, areas and uh, targeted campaign. We then sit down with our local authority colleagues again and review how that seems to have worked, what, what was the um, response rate that we can measure, um, what have we seen uh, by way of feedback from citizens' advice and others about people then pursuing uh, uh, applications for uh, uh, support and review what we might do next. So it is an evolving piece of work. One final question, Minister, if I may, um, and, and Mr McPherson too brought up the issues of, of dignity and respect, yeah. um, and I really do appreciate the focus that the government is, you know, is putting on ensuring this system delivers that, but I suppose we, in order to achieve that, you have to have an adequate income. You know, we can treat people with utmost dignity and respect, but if the benefits are simply inadequate because they keep decreasing because of inflation, then it's very hard to deliver that. So um, we've heard from many, many organisations that there should be an annual uprating mechanism on the face of the bill. Uh, NHS Lothian said annual uprating of benefits should not be discretionary. So is this something that the government is considering? Yes, I've, I've um, seen and uh, read that evidence and we, we will, of course, um, uh, continue to consider what we may do there. We've made the commitment um, in terms of uprating of disability uh, assistance. Um, uh, we will look at uh, the other areas um, and uh, consider what we might do in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark Griffin. Nairn, apologies, can we now, Minister, for um, arriving late? Um, I'd like to go back to the issue of the balance between primary and secondary legislation and go into a bit more detail as to some of the calls you know, from some of the organisations. And at the outset, I say that I don't envy the task of Minister and officials in, in getting that balance right. Not, not an easy job, certainly. Um, but we've touched on some of the, the areas already, and that was uh, a duty to ensure entitlement is met and income maximisation um, on annual uprating um, too, whether that would be um, an appropriate place to, to put that on the, on the face of the bill in primary legislation to give uh, people an upfront assurance um, that there would be annual uprating, that their benefits would increase in line with inflation. But um, the, th the third one that I wanted to touch on, um, and it's something we've spoken about before, was um, disability assessments and the Minister said previously um, th that a legislative ban she feels would be the wrong way because I quote, it brings significant potential for other difficulties and unintended consequences to occur. Um, I wonder if you're able to set out what those uh, difficulties and unintended consequences would be. Sure, thank you. Um, I think uh, in terms of unintended consequences, so I am very mindful that when you put something in primary legislation, your language, you know, notwithstanding the uh, points we've discussed on dignity and respect, your language needs to be very clear and careful. Um, I do not want us to get into a situation. So what we've said very clearly is that we will not use the private sector in terms of one-to-one -one health assessments in disability benefits. 
I don't want us to get into a situation where um, uh, the, putting something like that on the face of the bill means that we are then um, constrained from accepting uh, supporting evidence, for example, in support of an application that comes from a private sector organisation, which it may do. Uh, it may come from any of the private healthcare providers uh, that supports an, an individual's application. I certainly don't want us to be in a situation where we are precluding uh, private sector in terms of, for example, IT contracts and so on. And so what I'm looking at is devising uh, a model such that uh, it is clear that it will not be provided by the private sector because of the nature of that model. And that is the way uh, the work that the expert group is undertaking uh, and that we're working with uh, some uh, parts of our experience panels on is to devise what the assessment model will look like. Um, I would then hope that that would be described in regulations around disability assistance. Okay, but as was spoken about, a lot of, the, a lot of people view um, the new social security system through the prism of the ex existing system, and I think that would be one bold statement to put in the face of the bill um, that is solely for the use of um, assessments, medical assessments, that the, the private sector would be banned and this would be done entirely by the public sector. But I take on board uh, the Minister's point. Um, on the issue of annual uprating, um, I don't know whether you'd like to expand on where um, your officials see any difficulty in placing annual uprating um, on the face of the bill. No, I think, as I've said to Ms. Uh, Johnson, we, we are um, looking at that and a number of other areas which may um, uh, be appropriate in the face of the bill or not, and we'll return to that when we get to stage two, and we've got the benefit of this committee's report. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Um, there's no more questions. Uh, thank you for, for answering very honestly and for the official as well for being here. I now close the meeting and we'll go into private session. Thank you.